you are standing on the promises of God. Because uh, if you're standing anywhere else, you may be on sinking sand. Yep. But it's good to be here and appreciate each one that's here. And uh, it's always a it's always a blessing to get to come and stand and open up the Word of God. And so we we just want to thank you for being here, being with us. And we'll go to the Lord a word of prayer, and, and then we will go on and ask our young adults to come and sing one of our creek songs to open up our service. Our Father, we do want to bow in your presence to thanksgiving for this another beautiful day, a beautiful fall day, Lord. And we just want to thank you for your hand of grace and mercy that's upon our life. Lord, you've brought us through another week, and we've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed it with you. And so we ask you now to bless as we look at the, the Word of God in a few moments and, and uh, as we continue with some singing. And I just trust that God will bless and touch each heart as we open up the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Jesus, Lord, as he 
traveled about. They went from various places, from place to place, preaching uh, the kingdom and, and rallying the people and feeding the hungry and all that he did. And as I was doing that, I was thinking about a few things, just like if you would look back over in chapter 15, just to bring us up to 16, you would see over here in chapter 15, verse 21, it says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And then he's there, and then you look around a little bit, and he's somewhere else. In that verse 29, it says, And Jesus departed from thence and came unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. You go on down a little bit further in that chapter and uh, look at verse 39. It said, And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came to the coast of Magdala. So on and on we could go. I, I, was, I was thinking about that because we have here, and I don't know if I could go a little further, but here in our text as we read it tonight, it talks about the fact that when Jesus came into the coast of Sicilia, Philippi, he was on the move. He, he was uh, kind of like a, a missionary who went from place to place, preaching the kingdom, preparing people's hearts to receive their king. And as he went, he saw the conditions of things that was there, and he fed the multitudes, and he'd done all kinds of things while he was going. So it's quite a, quite, a, quite a situation as I read that and began to think about what my text was going to be tonight. It took me back to about 28 years that Benny and I traveled in mission work on our Indian reservations all across America. And I got a call this week from a young man uh, on the Pine Ridge Reservation. I saw that young man saved and uh, really commit his life to the war at Pine Ridge. We got very close. I go back there every, every year and preach there at Pine Ridge and the community around. And uh, I can go into a lot of detail about how close we got. He still calls me. I call him less than he calls me. But uh, Mike, is, he's, he's still in there. Later, he answered the call to preach. The missionary that was there had to leave because of health conditions. Mike's the pastor of the church. Uh, Baptist Church there at Pine Ridge. But I was thinking about being in Pine Ridge and preaching and then leaving there and going to another place and going through Wounded Knee, Porcupine, up to Sharp's Corner where another Baptist church is at and preaching up there and then going on from there over to Kyle. And there they had their, their jail and prison like deal. Uh, that's where they kept a lot of people. And I went over to Kyle and I would had to, because of people like Mike and uh, everybody knew him, he was a he was a suit from that area. Uh, got in the jail and I got to preach to the to the inmates. Put them in a big room and had them set on the floor against the wall. And I went in and preached the word of God. And I got to thinking about that as I was reading and studying and about you know, reminds me of my travels among our Indian people. I can go from reservation reservation to reservation and share instances and stories about where we would go, taking the gospel, even down in the middle of the village. Someone said, would you preach down here? And I said, sure. So they said, they sent me a loudspeaker, left downtown, by the little town, it was just a village. I went down there and preached down there, I went back to pick up truck. I mean, I was ready to preach at the drop of a hat anywhere they would let me drop the hat. Yeah. I thought about the Lord Jesus and him going with his disciples and all that was going on as many people as he had come in contact with and the things that he had accomplished and done. And as I read this, it says when Jesus, in verse 13 of chapter 16, when Jesus came into the coast of Sicily of Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? <laughs> Made me think about myself. Some of them Indian folks on reservation, there'd be someone said, Who does that guy anyhow? <laughs> Where's he from? You know. Oh, he's from he's a 
Creek Inn for Oklahoma, way down south down there, you know. So I, a lot of things go through my mind, probably things I probably had me on tell. But he had, he was there and, and he had the disciples was with him everywhere he went. Did all these different places I kind of read to you in this other, this other chapter. And so he asked them the question, who? Whom do men say that I and son man am? He, he wanted to know what they thought about him. And, uh, you know, he, he addressed the fact, uh, I the son of man. Well, he was. And he addressed himself that way over and over again. And I could show you by just looking back a little bit. That was, that was the phrase he used over and over again. And so I come into the reservation so much, it got to be the point that, oh, that creek's coming back up here. I say, I'm running up hill, ain't it? <laughs> I'm way down south. But anyhow, uh, I, I just wanted to bring this up to you how, how if you'll read the Word of God and you start catching where he's, where he's at, where he's, when he's leaving, where he's going to, and the people he's involved with, you can really learn a lot about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he, he asked them, he said, well, who, who do men say that I am? What's on their mind? And uh, we know according to scripture that he, he addressed himself as then the son of man. But he was much more than that. If you look to the very first chapter of the book of Luke, here's what God says about him through an angel. Whenever he was to be born of Mary uh, in verse number 35 of, of uh, chapter 1 of the book of Luke, here, here's, here's what uh, the angel said. The angel said to Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The Son of God. So as you, as you think about that, Heaven wanted her to know that he was not just going to be the son of man. He was going to be the son of God. Yet in reality, he was the God man. He was 100% man because Mary gave birth to him. But he was 100% God because God's the one who made the birth possible. So Jesus was just kind of wanting to know what was men saying about him? What, what was... What was being scattered in the regions where he was at? And so if you look at verse number 14, and we'll try to really get into it here, the Bible says, and they said, some say, thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah's, or one of the prophets. They was hooking him up and relating him to Old Testament people that they knew about other than John the Baptist. And why was they doing that? What, what was on their mind? What was in their heart? Well, I want you to think about it. Jesus, if you study the scripture, he spent the most of his time among the common people away from Jerusalem. He was out in the highways and byways that tells all the villages and crossing the little uh, seas and all the things. So he was out there with them more than he was in the city or in Jerusalem because then the Pharisees did want nothing to do with him. They wanted him killed. They, uh, he'd show up and do some teaching at the synagogue and man, they would be trying to stone him. They didn't care who he was. They wanted him out of their hair. So he, he spent most of his time there. So they said, well, some said, no, man, he, he, he's John the Baptist risen from the dead. Man, he's come back. And they thought he was John the Baptist. Well, why would they think that? Because of the type of preaching that John did. You remember when John there in the book of Matthew chapter 3, he showed up on the scene in, in, in the wilderness of Judea, and he began to preach for the people of that area to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The king is here. And so you need to repent, get Get ready for the kingdom to get it underway. So they thought he was John the Baptist risen from the dead. Well, what would link Jesus 
to John. Well, if you go over to chapter 14, verse 4, and up verse 17, you'd find out that when Jesus had got baptized, gone through that wilderness experience of 40 days fasting, meeting Satan, and then coming out, he came and started preaching just like John. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So everybody that heard the two of them thought, wow, John was, he had his life taken away. But this man, Jesus, is John come back from the dead? So they thought he was John. Well, then there was others who thought he was, uh, I, I know that our New Testament calls him Elias, it's Elijah. And the reason they thought of him being like Elijah was because of the power, supernatural power that he had. These people were not a bunch of dummies. They knew something about the Old Testament prophets. They heard it taught. And Elijah shut the waterworks down because of the rotten king that was over Israel. And the Bible lets us know that he had to run for his life. And a widow woman took him in and took care of him and fed him. And she had a son. And the son died. And so she called Elijah and my son is dead. You know, he's died. Well, Elijah, he went up, laid down over the boy, prayed, and then picked the boy up. The boy walked out with him, and they went down. He gave the boy back to his mother. So that was quite a story. That was quite a, an, an occasion. And so that traveled down through time and was taught in their synagogues and whatnot. So people knew about Elijah raising the dead. Well, Jesus showed up. And he was going down the road, and here come a, a funeral procession that had a young man, older boy, or whatever he was, uh, headed for the cemetery. And, and the mother, she didn't have a husband. He was her only son, probably her only hope of someone to help her with the livelihood. She was following the, the funeral procession and broken, and he stopped it. He told the boy to get up, and he gave the boy back to his mother. So some said, oh no, he's not John the Baptist. He's Elijah. Uh, he, he raises the people from the dead. So a lot of things was going on and Jesus was just gonna kind of find out what, 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 what people think about me. Who do they think I am? Well, then others said, oh, he's Jeremiah. He's, he's a man that weeps. He was at the graveside of Lazarus and he was weeping. He, 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 he wept over the city of Jerusalem because of their sin and because of the situation that was going on there. So they thought, man, that's got to be, that's got to be Jeremiah. He's come back from the dead because he's, he weeps over the condition of our people. He has a broken heart. So Jesus found out from his disciples mingling among the people who they thought he was. And they began to give the different stories. I could have went a lot deeper and a lot longer by reading the scripture to you, but it's going to take all night. <clears throat> Some said, oh, he's one of them prophets. He's always prophesying this and that, you know, and, and the kingdom's coming and the king is coming and where's the king and all this stuff. And there's scriptures that says that to some of the people said, oh, he's one of them prophets from the Old Testament. So there was all kinds of thoughts about who Jesus was. So Jesus then, he said uh, to his disciple, in verse number 15, look at this. He saith unto them, but whom say ye, you, that I am? Do you really know who I am? And I don't think I even give a title of my message, but the title of my message tonight is, Do You Know Jesus? Do you really know who? I didn't want to go into all that. Do you really know who he is? Do you really know Jesus? Who he is? And now we're going to kind of get into the message, okay? But I want you to think about that. Jesus said, but whom say ye that I am? Do we really know 
in this dispensation of the church age that people really know that he is the very true son of God, the savior of mankind, the only one. We, we've got a multitude of people in America today that think if they're a Baptist, they're okay. Baptists won't save you one lick. A lot of people say, well, I belong to the Methodist Church or the Assembly of God Church. The church has no hope of saving you or anybody else. There is those who say, well, uh, we believe you, that if you've been baptized, you, you're going to make it. Baptism won't save you. Well, I'm faithful to church. I'm there at least three to four times out of every month. That won't save you either. There is one, one hope of salvation, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's asking his disciples, if they really understand, do you know who I am? Well, I'm so sure thankful that Peter, he was kind of the spokesman. He was the one who was always getting up and telling things, amen? And he, he, uh, he let them know. He, he let Jesus know, I know who you are. I know who you are. You're, you are, and look, look, look right there in verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I mean, Peter had it right on cue. Jesus asked his disciples. He wanted to find out if they had come to grips. Did they really understand and know who he was? Those who have followed Jesus, spent time with him, should be the best ones to ask because they have knowledge of who he is. I know him. I know him because I met him face to face. I met him and become one of his followers just like these disciples did. I know him because I've walked with him all these many, many years and, and through studying the word of God. I mean from Genesis to Revelation, going through school and having a complete Bible study of this book. I know who Jesus is. Anyone who ask me, I can tell them in a minute. It's like that. Yes, I know who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's the one that was promised who came into this world to save the lost from their sins. I, I know exactly who he is. He's come really and he will set up his kingdom when this thing is all over. He come to do it early. They wouldn't accept him. So he's still going to set up his kingdom. It's still coming. It's still on its way. And so as he asked that question, Peter, Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll tell you what. Peter, he knew. Listen, Peter had not only come to grips with that, but Peter had come to believe, trust, and want to walk with Jesus even prior to this question. In the book of, of uh, John, I think it's John, yeah, John chapter 6. I want to read this to you. I want you to see something. And, and I want, I want, I'm, I'm hoping, praying, and trusting everybody here at Will Oak Creek, and especially you young people growing up, who have opportunity to learn this book. He, there was a time when Jesus began his ministry and, and his teaching back over here in uh, the early days. And he uh, had some different ones who really got excited and they became disciples. A disciple is a learner. And they hung right in there until he started teaching some real serious doctrine. And they quit him. Sometimes that happens in a local church. Mm -hmm. You get to preaching some real straight doctrine from the Word of God, and you'll have some people quit you. I've seen that happen. But I want you to, if you want to turn there, you can. If you don't, you can just listen. But in John chapter number 6, look at this with me. Jesus had a pretty stiff teaching up there. And in verse number 66 of chapter 6, I want you to look at this. After teaching this straight doctrine, they couldn't handle it. They, couldn't, they just could not accept it. The Bible says, and from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They quit. There's church people that will quit you if you get on straight doctrine 
and especially if it's something that goes against something they've been taught or heard over the years. They don't have no ground to stand on, but that's what they believe because they've heard it. They leave it. But they left Jesus. But look down at verse 67. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto the twelve, those twelve disciples that he had called in the very beginning that were fishermen, he said, uh, well, one of them was a tax collector, he said to them, will ye also go away? Will you, will you leave me also? Look who, look who spoke up. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words, underscore the words of eternal life. You've got the message. We believe that you have the word of, you're giving us that word of God. We can trust what you're saying about eternal life. He says, and we believe in verse 69 and are sure that thou art the Christ. Now look what this next little phrase says. The son of the living God. He got that all together early. Well, let me tell you, church, I got it all together early. I was 28 years old. I was not raised in church. I didn't have any preconceived doctrinal ideas or thoughts about church or how to get to heaven or nothing. I was, I was as empty as a gourd. And when that pastor kept preaching and preaching, I started right after my 28th birthday in September, listening to that man preach the word of God. And on the 11th day of December, of that same year, I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Amen. These men followed him, and from the beginning, they realized he speaks as no other man they've ever heard. There's no rabbi, there's no teacher at the synagogue that speaks like this man speaks. And so he, they believed, they believed, and they followed him, and they believed that he was the Christ. And I know if you would go back in the Old Testament, and the same word would be Messiah. Israel was looking for their Messiah, the Christ. And so we have that here in our, in our text. But he said, thou art the son of the living God. Well, what did he say over here in Matthew, in chapter number 16? He said the same thing, didn't he? When he was confronted by Jesus, he'd been with him some time. As a matter of fact, Jesus is pushing toward the end of his ministry and life on earth. And so he's asking Peter, or asking the disciples, he said, uh, who, but whom say ye that I am? Have all of you got it together? Have you come to grips with it? I am that who I am. He is the great I am. He had talked there in the book of John over and over again. I am that I am. And so he asked them, and Peter told him, he said, thou art the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You know, that's something that we've got to really got to get a hold of. We're not just trusting the church or trusting anything. We're trusting Jesus Christ, God's Son, and we know that He was sent from God. He is as much God. John chapter number one, in the beginning was the Word. Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He made everything that was made. So the scripture bears it out. And John, John is a great book. One of these days I'm going to teach some principles out of that that I want everybody to really get a hold of. If anybody has even the slightest wondering, is Jesus really God? Yes, he's God in flesh. He's as much God as God in heaven. Except he, he's the second person. He's, he is uh, the second person of Godhead. And he came down and went through the process of being birthed into this world. So he's God in flesh. <clears throat> so Peter, he laid that thing out there plain and clear. If there's anything we need the world to know is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. 
And if they get to heaven, they got to come to him. That's right. He's got to be their savior. I'm, I'm going to kind of switch a little bit in my thought. <clears throat> and and I'm, I know you that are here, but anyone that's out there that when this goes out to our church family and maybe beyond, I'm going to ask another question. Today, in 2020, today, what thank you of Christ? What thank you of Jesus? Is he number one? Is he who he said he was? I'm, I'm going to tell you what he is. He said over and over again that he was the son of man. He was also identified as the son of God, just like Peter did. But as I think about all of that, and I think about how, how serious it is, and, and, and there's no one, there's no one who will ever become a believer in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord unless they hear the word of God preached or taught or both. They'll never do it. Never do it. They can't do it. It's impossible. They've got to hear the word. The Holy Spirit and the, and the word works that together just like that. And as the word of God is preached, the Holy Spirit of God takes that word, plants it into the heart of man through the hearing of the ear and, and they will accept Christ as their Savior. Turn if you would to the book of Romans with me. I'm going to be over just for a little while so you need to be over where you look on, look on with me. Romans chapter number 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 10. Look at verse number 13. I'm going to read a few verses and I, I want to I want to get this really across to not only us who are here at the church, but I want to get it across to whoever hears the message. I said that nobody will ever get saved apart from the Word of God. That's right. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Look what the Bible says here in verse number 13. He said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, or the Lord, shall be saved. Verse 14 says, How then shall they call on him? in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? See, see how this thing is going? Mm -hmm. they, can't, they can't believe if they don't hear. And how are they going to hear if there's not a preacher? And I'll go a little further and say a teacher who will really teach the word of God can do the same thing. But in verse 15 it says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring good glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Elias, or Elijah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? And you can turn over to the Old Testament and you can find that verse. <laughs> it's over there. It's over there in chapter 53. Notice what this next verse says, verse 17. So important. He says, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. No one can ever, will ever have faith in Jesus Christ. No one will ever be saved by the grace of God that does not hear the preaching of the word That's of God right. or the teaching of the word of God. Yes. They've got to hear it. it. It is absolutely a necessity. It's a must. We've got to get the word of God out to the regions beyond so people can hear it. I, uh, I am not happy with the COVID-19. I'm not happy with the churches that's had to not have services. But a lot of churches is doing what we're doing as a church at Will Murphy. They're sending it out. And there's people in Canada hearing me, will hear me preach this message in the morning. There's people on the Navajo Reservation because the Menorah of Islam is sending it out. So there's people everywhere that's given the word of God that I'm preaching right here. So I want you to look at a, a, a verse four with me right quick. In verse, uh, first, second Corinthians, I'm gonna read this. Uh, you don't have to look, but if you want to, I'll give you a second to get to second Corinthians chapter number six. And here's, here's what the scripture says, that it is of a necessity. You know, People are worried, and I'm not worried one bit. They're wondering if we're fixing to see the end of the world. I, if we live long enough, we will. 
If we don't, we'll be there when it happens. I'm ready to go. I could leave tonight and I'd be in heaven. I'm not, I'm not shook up about that. Let me get into this. <laughs> verse 6, you're, you're in chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians. The Bible says, When then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Don't hear it and not receive it. Amen. He says, For he said, in verse 2, I have heard thee at a time accepted. I want you to kind of get that little word in your mind, accepted. Mm -hmm. And in the day of salvation have I succored you, thee. Behold, now, right now, is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Amen. This is the accepted time. Today, people need to hear the message of Jesus Christ, yes. who he is, what he come to do, and what he'll do for them if they'll receive him as their personal savior. That's what, that's what this whole thing is about. The unsaved must be convicted of their sin. You know what? Even when I first started going to church here in Tulsa, I wasn't convicted of my sin. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit hadn't had time to bring that conviction as I heard the message of God. Yes. But as the message kept coming in, the Holy Spirit started working on my heart. And I started getting convicted. Oh, that sounds like me. In just a short time, I came forward, broken and weeping, asking the Lord to forgive me and save me. It took the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. So now is the day of salvation. This is the accepted time. It needs to be done now. Now. My goodness, we need to be given the Word of God out today. See, back over here in our in our in that 16th chapter of Matthew, we, we look over here and we see that that uh, in verse number 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon of Arjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. You know what? That's the key. We will never accept Christ unless it's revealed to us through the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. through the preaching of the Word of God. The Word of God has got to be preached. And so Jesus told Simon, he said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And so as we, we stop and think about this whole thought of, of, of Jesus dealing with his disciples and how that we do today, we need God to speak to our heart. This is the accepted time. This is the time that we need to get the message that Jesus said. There's a lot of people in any community we might want to go to who are in a time of distress. They're troubled. They got family that are dying with COVID-19. They don't know where they're at. They don't know where they're going. What happened to them? If they haven't been saved, we know where they're going. They're going to an eternity in a place called hell, a lake of fire. Now, folks, that's a horrible thing. Yes. I, I don't know whether you even stop to think about it or not, but I think about it all the time. How many people have died in our area? Henrietta, Ogie, Wetumpka, Hammond, you follow? How many people have died in our area since this thing started, and how many of them knew not Christ? Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of them, they're not even having services for them. Now, I won't tell you there's not even, even anything in their little obituary about them being Christian or going to church. You know what? That has to be a sign they weren't saved. If they were not saved, folks, them people, if they thought COVID was bad in hell, they are crying out to God for mercy. That's right. Man, we need to we need to seize the opportunity if we have a chance to talk to anybody about the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to do it. And like I said, I know some people say, oh, well, you know, when I, I've had them on the reservation say, you know, uh, and, and they, they try to honor me, you know, and, and, and respect me. Uh, I've been called rabbi and everything. <laughs> but they said, you know, I, I, my folks, I'm a Catholic. 
They baptized me when I was born. I said, well, are you still going to Catholic Church? Ah, oh, no, I don't go down that place. I said, well, what was your hope of being baptized? I mean, what was that all about? Well, that's what they do. We'll be all right, they said. I said, that's a lie. Why? I've said with people in the men's homes, face to face, and shared with them that what they told me, I said, let me tell you what the Bible said. That's not Bible. That may be Catholic, but it ain't Bible. Right. I said, you have to get old enough to understand that you are a sinner because you've done things wrong. I said, if I ask either one of you men, I, I, this one time I put two men, I said, if I ask you if you've done anything wrong, what would you tell me? They don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. They lived in the cesspool. And I said, you know what? If you don't have receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and ask him to forgive you and come into your life and bring you out of this mess, I said, one day you're going to die and you're going to face the judgment. I've known some, some that got saved while I was preaching up there. And I tell you some long stories about Cordell and, and some of the even women that came and got down in the dirt at the tent. And I go down and talk to them. They'd be weeping and crying and they didn't know what to do. And I, I would talk to them and they'd say, I've been a bad woman, you know. I've got these three kids. I've never been married and I'm, I've been on alcohol. Well, this Jesus you've been preaching about, will he forgive me? They don't know. Folks, I'm going to tell you, it's a sad world out there when you get away from God and away from the church. We need to realize that if people don't hear the preaching of the word, that's when I want to read that whole little thing. I hope you'll go back and read it there in Romans chapter 10. How shall they hear without preacher? How shall they accept Christ? That there's no hope for them. We have got to get the message out to them. Because hearing, I mean, if they're going to do it, I can't even keep my mind running. I've got too much on my mind right now. But <clears throat> that verse 17 that I gave you, so then faith, if a person's going to ever have faith in Jesus Christ as as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Bible said faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. They've got to hear it. You know what? God can't work on it if there's nothing to work on. He, he, he's got to work through the Word of God. That's right. The Word of God is life-giving. So that He's got to do that. Now, you know, so much, so many scriptures more that I could give you but, you know, I know a lot of people. Uh, I've heard them talking, you know, and some even talk to me about it. Man, you think it's, it's about to end? You know, this thing's going to be over? I said, what? Well, I don't know. All I know is the Bible says that uh, no man know of the day or the hour, just the Father of man. So I don't know. But I said, there is one thing. I said, we need to get the message out to the people and in the book of Hebrews, and I'm just going to read this to you right quick out of Hebrews. And I know you can get over it probably pretty quick too. The book of Hebrews. Get over to chapter number 9. I'll get over as fast as I can. But Hebrews chapter number 9. I want you to look at something in, in, that, in the verse 27 and 28. You as well as myself and anybody that's listening to me on this message, we all have an appointment with God. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in verse 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Listen, he's telling us that we're all going to die. I don't know whether we'll get out of here before the end of the world or not, but it don't make any difference. Everybody's going to die except those that are in Christ. If we do die, I'm not dying. I'm just moving out. I'm leaving this old piece of house out, back, back. Put it in the grave. But when Jesus comes, the one who for our sins, we can look for his appearing 
the second time. He's already come the first time. He's come the second time. He's going to come with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and all that are in the grave is going to rise first, and we're going to be in the air. So we have all got an appointed time. Every man, woman, boy, or girl on earth has got an appointed time. We're going to leave here, whether it's through death or through the rapture or the catching away of the church. But the thing of it is, between now and then, we really need to be trying to reach people so that they might uh, have opportunity to say, yes, I know who you are. Someone say, you know who Jesus is? Yes, sir. I met him on a few years back. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. Someone ever asked you that? You need to tell them that. Oh, yeah, I know him because I met him. And he's my Savior and, and my Lord that's right. and my soon coming King. Yes. I mean, get this stuff in your head. Get some Bible in your head. And when someone wants to ask you a question or you have an opportunity to tell them, you can give them some scripture. That's <laughs> right out of your head. We need to do that. Jesus told Peter there in that verse 18, he said, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. You're Peter. And, and you, you've got it together. I would put a but there, but the scripture says, and upon this rock, Jesus was pointing to himself, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I said to Kathy, people say, Peter, he was, he was for the church to be built. He's, he's, he's the one. Peter ain't. <laughs> no, Christ. And he says it that turn in verse. He says, you're Peter. But he said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Not be able to stop it. And I believe that with all of my heart, with all my soul, folks. Jesus, the church of Jesus Christ is built on the rock, the solid rock. That's right. And the gates of hell can't stop it. Now, you know, a lot of people say, boy, I don't know how we're going to stop the gates of hell. And I said, you really don't have to stop the gates of hell. Gates don't move. They're kind of planted to try to stop something. We just roll over it like a bulldozer. <laughs> Amen. Or a Sherman tank. Well, the gates can't stop us. You know why? Because we come in the power of Almighty God. Amen. And we're going to just move on through any gate that Satan throws up. And we're not going to let it stop because we are of the church of the living God. And we're built upon that rock our Savior. He's unmovable. Nothing I can do with him. He's going to be there for eternity. So we're going to be with him. Amen. So I just want you to stop and think about this tonight. And I want you to think about the fact that we know who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. Amen. He's the Son of God. That's what Peter said. Yes, sir. Simon Peter said, I know. He is the Son of God living God. So as we stop and think about the message, anywhere, anybody here, do you really know who Jesus is? He's the rock of our salvation. He is the one who died that we might have eternal life. Amen. And he's the one that's going to come back and get his Amen. Yes. on that day. So we just want to praise him and thank him and uh, just Pray for God's grace, mercy, and power to be with us and on us every day of our lives. And I want you to look at verse 17 again, I, I, and I'm going to quit. I really am. Verse 17, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon, or Jonah. And I want you to notice he says, For flesh and blood hath not revealed who, God, who, who I am, it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. The only one that's going to reveal to us who Jesus is is God's word through faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. That's the only way we'll know. So I trust and pray that God will just meet your needs and bless your heart and strengthen you in his word and help you to think about this book 
Every day of your life. Yes. We need to be in it. We need to be thinking about it. We need to be reading it. We need to be praying. Because this is our life. This is my life. And this is your life. You're saved. This is your life. Yes. This is your life. I know we have things we got to do in this world. But when you get back down to it, this truth, this is a life. And one of these days, we will stand and uh, We'll have to be able to record our life and uh, see what God says about it. And, and the Bible tells us that book of Revelation, chapter number 20, the last day, he's going to open up the books and he's got the record of our life. Yes. And he will check it out. And I want my record right. And I know you do. I know you do. Well, let's pray. Father, we do love you. And we do praise you and we are so absolutely thankful that you sent your son some 2,000 years ago as a baby in a manger who grew up to be the one who walked, the, the, the person of the Godhead who walked on planet earth to reach out to mankind. So thankful for that. So thankful our Father that we have had opportunity to sit and hear the word of God and to respond by receiving Christ as our Savior. And I pray, Father, that across this nation, for all the messages that have been going out from all the diff different preachers and churches, that there will be people who will hear the message of salvation and by faith receive your Son as their Savior. Father, bless us. Meet our needs tonight. Strengthen and bless our church in Jesus' name. Thank you.